today's last session of air let us just go through it peacefully ok. Uh, let us take a look at some synthesis of all the work that has happened ok. We would not get into the nitty gritty of size distributions and what is the mechanism for removal of gases from atmosphere using rain we would not get into the nitty gritty just let us take a broad overview. So, um, I call this the synthesis phase this is the place where students will begin to put things together and accordingly I give them an assignment or a part of an assignment in which they have to then deal with all the thinking that is required for them as somebody who is accountable for the air quality in the city ok. So, this is the synthesis part one of the first things I do um, in the first lecture I just clean up the entire board and I ask students to come up on the board and uh, start to create some kind of a mind map ok. It is not an individual mind map it is a collective mind map of all the students what do they already know about air pollution and from time to time I will ask certain questions in the inquiry which provokes them to think a little more a little differently and say oh we had not thought about that and that then triggers some other thoughts for some other students and then they keep. So, by the time we are done with the one hour of lecture the entire board is pretty much filled and we have all kinds of you know we have white chalk of course, but we also have colored chalk. So, then we go ahead and uh, look to see if we can classify uh, some of the information on the board under some categories. So, red chalk is used then to circle all the information that probably could be characterized together and then yellow chalk for something else and uh, green chalk for something else and then everybody given that everybody has a smartphone uh, phone with a camera. Uh, so, we take a few good pictures and then just share it with each other. So, that way in some way the record of the work that got done in the class and each one contributes to it. So, I will just uh, I encourage it very strongly not just in this class, but even in other classes even for even for my PhD students research um, some time to time you know it is like they have been reading so much and there is no clarity as to what is happening how it is going to go. So, then every 3 months or something like that you say ok uh, look at the mind map that you had developed 3 months ago and see if there are new branches to be added or you may want to just redraw the entire mind map. So, mind map typically it is a very well tested well documented if you just went to Google and you said mind map you will find a lot of material over there. There are some templates also available some applications are also available if you wanted to develop your own mind map on the PC itself you can do that. Uh, but here is an example ok here is an example of a um, mind map it is just putting together of your thoughts in some kind of a uh, order here is the website for it you are welcome to go look at it. This is about bioethanol and then you know the way these people have branched is what who where sources production issues others and they have got different colors and different branches this is how they have organized it. I came across somewhere IBM had started using these mind maps as a part of training and they realized that what normally would take 10 days to get done usually got done in a much shorter time because they started using mind maps. So, I you know very um, strongly recommend the use of these for your students um, and they, they begin to learn how to organize themselves how to organize their thoughts and there could always be a lot of these branches which have questions I mean they are really not I know it is there, but I do not quite know what it is and that you put a question mark over there and over a period of time you get to do the reading and you know figure those out questions. Our job is to add to the questions in some sense. Uh, I usually do not answer the questions by now you may have noticed already try not to answer the questions because there is enough material out there which is available and uh, uh, there, there are masters out there who have written up books and who have written up articles. So, you know it is best to kind of direct the students to the masters and let and then they have difficulty in understanding and appreciation of what is going on over there then of course, they come back and we can discuss and sometimes not sometimes most of the time I learn some new things because they looked at it from an angle which I had not looked at ok. So, mind maps is something which I very highly recommend here is a mind map I am going to call it a mind map you can call it a pictorial you can call it a flow diagram whatever else you, you may want to call it, uh, but this is for you know uh, pollutants and I could not find I could not quite find one. Uh, which would kind of match up with what we wanted to do or what we have been doing, uh, but you know there are you, you may look you, you can look at other places. By the way the other restriction I have is I can only show you uh, material that is not copyrighted ok. So, if you just went to Google and you said mind maps air pollution 
you will probably be able to find the mind map that you are looking for and you know have students. So, you could even have students look up different mind maps and discuss them in class or say you know which of the aspects will we be, will we be covering which of the aspects will not be covering. Okay? So, it is a nice holistic uh, picture of the study and of the work that needs to and the cause and effects and you know what is it that we might need to study. Then I have been doing a little bit of role playing with you uh, in having you be uh, accountable for the air quality in your city. Okay? I have called you the collector okay? and uh, probably that is a little um, loose way of saying it, but I can talk about it today because we have been together for 6 lectures now. So, I can say collector being a collector really I think everybody appreciates and understands that what I am really saying is somebody who is accountable for that particular city and you could actually say look and I am accountable or you know responsible everybody is responsible, but I am accountable for and you can define your accountability and you can begin to find partners you can begin to have conversations to fulfill on that accountability. So, I am just saying if you if you were a resource person uh, you were a partner for me in your city then you know what is it that you could create as an accountability so that then we can play together for a longer period of time. So, uh, for students it might be something that they experiment with that they play with over a period of one semester or six months, but you and I actually can take it on as a long term uh, partnership which could be fulfilled over the next 5, 10 years uh, which would actually be beneficial for you for your city in that local area and of course, your college uh, gets to participate in it fully. So, that is as far as role playing some of it could be real some of it for students especially uh, could be something which they experiment with, uh, but role playing you know it really actually has them discover what is it that they really like to do. Um, I if you visiting Mumbai sometime I am sure this is in other places too, uh, but I went with my son yesterday uh, to Kidzania. I do not know how many of you have heard of this place Kidzania. Okay? It is actually a place for children where they are related to as adults. Okay? And so, you can do some fun stuff for which you have to give money and the money is internal money it is called kidzos and um, then after some time you realize you are running out of money. So, then you have to go work. So, you have to go de be a delivery boy or you have to go to a, a studio a furniture studio to deliver some luggage or you have to be a police person and go hunt for the criminal you know all kinds of uh, interesting things that they do over there. Um, so, the role playing I think it is important that in the role playing uh, people begin to discover the nature. I, I never had you know I did not know till class 12th or maybe even after I got into the BTEC program I did not quite know what an engineer does really you know my parents were my father was a business person and I never had a chance I had no engineers in my family. So, I did not quite know what engineering was all about and uh, you did you got into engineering because you had taken mathematics in class 12th and you happened to pass a few entrance exams. So, here you are now stuck with engineering. Okay. Uh, so, somewhere you know around the fourth year of my BTEC that time it used to be a five, 5 year BTEC I realized that you know maybe I made a mistake by coming for engineering. So, I decided I was going to go into design. So, I went to NID Ahmedabad for a year and uh, at the end of 9 months over there I realized I thought that was my passion. Okay? Uh, I thought design was my passion it still is, but you know um, whether I could convert it into a profession whether I could con convert it into a career was something which was not clear for me. So, I went there and I actually realized in 9 months over there that it is probably not really what I want what I thought design was all about you know. So, it is again, but this was my choice I actually went by choice and you know uh, I knew what I was getting into. Um, and second part was that uh, uh, suddenly realized that I was still depending on my parents for money. So, I actually um, it was fine I used to get 600 rupees stipend at that time it was sufficient to be able to deal with your mess food and you know some little day to day stuff over there, but 600 rupees was adequate at that time. But then I fell ill at some point and um, that time I had to ask my father again for money. So, I was a little embarrassed about that a little shy about that uh, and then in the meantime what happened was I had appeared for an interview uh, with ONGC um, while I was still on campus. So, somewhere around 9 months after I was at NID uh, I get this uh, letter offer from ONGC and uh, it was one of those jobs where you do 14 days on the rig platform offshore and then 14 days are free. So, I thought you know this may be a good idea if I 
continue, if I take up a job there and I continue to do my design in those 14 days, that was at least the idea, some fantasy world I was living in. So then that's when I went back to engineering and actually when I started working, I realized I'd learned a lot during my BTEC days and that actually I enjoyed engineering, okay. So sometimes it takes a few years for you to find out what is it that you really enjoy. And so these students that we have with us in the class, you know, anywhere from what, 19 to 21, that's the age group, they're just turning adults, uh, they have no clue what they want in life, really. I mean, you know, they have some peer pressure of, you know, wanting to do some things and, but I think it takes at least a good five to ten years before you actually find out what is it that you're good at, what is it that you really enjoy, and where the money might be, and where is the level of comfort that you have. So um, giving this as an exercise to um, students for me is just for them to explore, to see if this is something that might be of interest to them. Um, and sometimes, you know, it might encourage them to get into politics. And believe me, you do need some really, really good, smart people in politics. Politics is not what it used to be 50 years ago. Uh, you've got to be really savvy, and if you think like your, the analytical mind thinks a particular way, um, then, you know, I think it might make a difference. So that's as far as role playing is concerned, and I'm sharing this with you because I think I wanted to underline the importance of it. Uh, and if you look at our own selves, our own lives, and look to see, you know, what is the role that I'm playing, and what is the role that I might invent to play, not just because I got pushed into engineering because I had mathematics in class 12, but if I really were to pick up something to do. It may not happen overnight, by the way, okay? One of the, one of the first things that would come when you decide to do something else is what will happen to life as I know it today. I have family to take care of and I have, you know, other accountabilities, et cetera, et cetera. It may not happen overnight, but some seeds sown now might begin to shape up and you might have to committedly work towards it for the next two, three, five years before you get to that point. And, you know, I think students, if they can begin to appreciate that, um, they'll appreciate what is being taught to them, they'll appreciate the kind of struggles they themselves would have to deal with. They'll also appreciate, the, you know, why is it that, uh, you know, some of the things that adults do are so nonsensical, okay? They actually have an appreciation of it's not so nonsensical after all. There may be some solid sound reasons why things are working a particular way or not working a particular way, okay? So there's just appreciation for being human. Okay, so I'm coming back to accountability and I'm going to take your home city. Okay, so whatever you, I know you're at a remote center, uh, but you would probably another three days from now, four days from now, you'll, back, you'll be back in your normal environment. So that is your home city. That's what I'm referring to as home city. It could be hometown, home city, depending on the size and scale of where you live. Um, and uh, it may not necessarily be true that you have air pollution problems. Okay, you might have a very, clean, but you might have water problems, you might have um, solid based problem, you might have, you know, agricultural burning problems, so, you know, different kinds of things that you would have to deal with. The point is to put yourself in a position of saying, oh, is this something that calls to me? Is it something that I am, uh, that would, you know, to make it worthwhile for me to get up in the morning? And uh, by the way, just to give you, an, my, it's difficult to wake up my nine-year-old son every morning, okay? It's difficult, especially during vacations, it's difficult. Of course, during school days, he has to get up, so he gets up. Uh, but you should just know, just because we were going to Kidzania yesterday, he woke me up at quarter to six in the morning, okay? Uh, Kidzania was four o'clock in the afternoon, all right? But he woke me up at quarter to six in the morning because he was so excited. So um, I think my intent here is that um, the alarm clocks in your house goes redundant, that you will not need an alarm clock because you've got something so exciting in life that you wake up for it without an alarm clock, okay? So that's my intent. Hidden agenda. But that's why I have it, I, I said it, okay? All right, so, um, so I'm just going to highlight again. Again, this is for, not for you, all right? This is not for you. At the same time, it's for you, okay? So you, and when I say you, I actually have, I look into each student's eyes and make sure that they understand that I'm talking to them. Otherwise, invariably, they think I'm talking to the person next to them, all right? So I make sure that they, that that one person, he or she is in charge, is the collector, collector, collector. I, in fact, do it in multiple colors and in many slides to make sure that, you know, it actually happens. I even have it animated, but I can't do the animation here. Probably need to, it's in the unsaid, but let me say it anyway. You are the collector of your home city, okay? All right? Now, read the bottom. It says, when did a mother ever need to attend a T10KT training workshop to take care of children? All right? So, the important thing is, are you going to own your child? 
and I am saying child in the form of in this particular case as an example as a game to play air quality in your city. If that is your child I really do not need to train you ok. The point is are you going to be the mother or are you going to be the father to that particular child that is my invitation alright. Alright, so let us just take a look at what are the inputs that go into decision making. I, I, I do not know if you see this but there is a lot of things which are light in color and I am going to take one at a time so that uh, the focus of what we are discussing is in dark. Uh, again I am doing it in, um, in lieu of um, the animation here but this is in some sense these are the steps that one would take uh, it is some kind of a mind map of what are the inputs that would go into decision making about air quality or air quality management in your city. Okay, so let us begin. So, first of all, you begin as a collector, as a person accountable, you would be in you you would be curious to know what is the current status of air quality? What is the current status? Is it bad? Is it not bad? Is it in compliance? Is it healthy, unhealthy? Okay, so you would use the criteria pollutants, the concentration of the criteria pollutants, you would use the national ambient air quality standards to be able to figure out whether the air quality in your city, in your town is good or not. Okay. And there is the NAMP network which is national ambient monitoring program and there are some other continuous ambient air quality monitoring systems uh, which are used to be able to give you historical data. Okay. So, I am just going to share with you the historical data for criteria pollutants collected from NAMP stations which is the NAMP national ambient monitoring program. So, at Chandrapur there are 6 stations which are monitoring for PM10 sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen ok. So, you are measuring for those uh, twice a week which means approximately 100 days in a year. So, you have 100 measurements for these 3 parameters across the country. In your city it is for you know in Chandrapur there are 6 stations. So, you can get from these 6 different locations you can get these measurements. So, the, if I look at the measurements uh, that is what they look like if the, the slide may not be very clear, but you have NOx. SO2, RSPM and SPM. RSPM is respirable suspended particulate matter which is PM10 which is used in a higher volume sampler where you use a cyclone to remove all particles greater than 10 micrometers and what you are left with is the respirable fraction. And they also take SPM which is the total ok all the particulate matter which is there even though the even the even the particles greater than 10 micrometers the total suspended matter. So, what you see over here is 4 graphs and this is over many many years by the way it is 2004 to 2013 ok that is about 9 to 10 years and these are averages these are averages for the years average. So, you take 100 data points and you average it for the whole year and it clearly shows that some things are downward trend. So, this is not very readable probably, but this is uh, oxides of sulphur and this is oxides of nitrogen I think uh, these are particulate matter. So, while Nox and SOX are on the way downward trend ok, particulate matter seems to be going high. So, that is the status of air quality in Chandrapur. The red dashed line, the red dashed line is showing the compliance limit. So, that is the standard. So, anything lower than that standard you are ok, the air is safe to breathe, it is healthy not a problem. But if you go to look at the particulate matter in both cases whether it is re respiratory or whether it is to total suspended matter in both cases the pollution levels the the, pollu the level the concentration levels are much higher than what is the compliance uh, standard ok. So, clearly we have a problem in Chandrapur and the Chandrapur problem is mainly to do with the particulate matter and not so much as the SOX and NOX. Oh in which case now we have a new understanding of the problem of air quality in Chandrapur what we are saying is NOX and SOX are not an issue ok. What is an issue is particulate matter. So, are there places where particulate matter is coming, but NOx is not coming and SOx is not coming ok. But logically that is what the answer is what is the source? A source which does not produce oxides of sulphur, a source that does not produce oxide, but produces particulate matter hmm that would be interesting to find out ok. So, that is the logical next step ok. So, then you go to the sources right. So, when you look at the second step in inputs into decision making uh, you look at the different sources. So, as we had discussed earlier there are point sources and I say over there organized and unorganized sectors ok. Organized sectors are people who are uh, legally permitted by the pollution control board to you know produce something they are registered they actually have taken permission um, for that industrial setup 
and they've been given permission to pollute to a certain level. Okay, don't take this badly. They have been given permission to pollute up to a certain level because without that there would be no industry. So there would be exceed a certain level of emissions is what the regulation is about. Okay? So and of course again, you know, the impact of that pollutant whether it is released at 10 meters height or 50 meters height or 300 meters height is going to influence the overall effect that it has in that entire air shed, entire region. And therefore, level to which you can pollute is permitted by the um, pollution control board. That's what would call the organized sector. Then there is an unorganized sector where somebody just sets up something and you know starts running and you know it's too far away and it doesn't come to notice from you know many months or many years uh, as to what that operation is. So that would be considered uh, unorganized sector. And invariably that gets discovered when you go uh, you know kilometer by kilometer. Uh, looking for different sources and looking at any new developments and you have a checklist to see yes I have accounted for this oh this is a new one I haven't accounted for this one. The second source is uh, line source, the traffic and a lot of the information would come from the RTO for this uh, but at the same time we know that a lot of vehicles for example that are registered in one region but being run in another region um, and uh, Chandrapur being a mining area. Uh, a lot of trucks uh, that are there are, may not necessarily be registered in Chandrapur. So therefore you have to go for field surveys, you actually have to go and count the number of trucks and uh, what time of the day and uh, what kind of trucks, how, what kind of cars, what kind of buses. So you know it's a very important uh, part of the inventory development that you do field surveys. The last one is area sources which is again given by field surveys also by census data. So for example in a particular region you have a lot of population and all population over there, it's a slum, uh, they are using coal. Now Chandrapur has a lot of coal, Chandrapur has mining, okay, there's a lot of coal available. Coal is not sold in Chandrapur by the way for burning in chulas, for burning in cookstuffs. It's just available, okay, it's just available, either cheaply available or freely available. Um, so people use that, people who cannot afford to get LPG cylinders or even kerosene, uh, this is available, so they just use it. Um, so census data could tell you the size of the population uh, that is using solid fuels. By the way, again, within Chandrapur area, they use coal. But you, if you step out 50 kilometers outside Chandrapur, coal disappears. Suddenly there's no coal. Again, people are using wood for, um, as biomass for their solid fuel. They don't have kerosene, they don't have LPG, but they use wood because wood is freely available over there. So it varies depending on where you are. But again, if you were to focus in Chandrapur, we know for sure that a large population is using uh, coal cook stoves and coal cook stoves, you know, the interesting thing about coal cook stoves is when you light it in the beginning, okay, for about 15-20 minutes it is just a grand source of smoke, okay, on and on and on and on and on and on the smoke keeps going on. At some point in time when it catches uh, fire when it is actually ignited, at that point in time then the smoke begins to diminish quite a bit, You, it almost goes non-existent and then you take the cook stove into the kitchen and that's when you do the cooking. So when you're cooking, it's not so bad. Uh, when it's inside the room, it's not so bad. It's not good, but it's not so bad. But before that, you know, the 15, 20 minutes uh, when you were lighting up the cook stove, uh, all of Chandrapur is being treated to this lovely smoke, okay. Um, very specific to this particular city. So I'm sure there are different things like that which are specific to your hometown. And only you will be able to say uh, what are the issues uh, there which, uh, by the way, I always remember my professor, uh, when I had just come back to India, I spent here for, uh, I was here for about nine months and then I went back for the summer to do my, some research uh, with my PhD advisor. And um, so uh, my head of the department, you know, uh, really nice gentleman, he called me and he says, um, he's from the Middle East. So he says, uh, hey Sethi, are you, how long have you been in India? So I said, I've been in there for about uh, nine months. So he says, are there things in India that still disturb you? So I said, yeah. He says, good, good, do something about it very quickly, otherwise you'll get used to it, okay. So uh, it's a, uh, I remember him because, you know, you're right, it's actually after some time, that's what it is. Chandrapur, everybody, that's what it is. You know, of course, in the morning you get up, you've got to see chulas. In fact, if suddenly chulas are missing, you'll think, you know, where am I? Am I really in Chandrapur or not? Okay. So, um, 
you might have to look at your city with new eyes when you are doing this, you know. Uh, people walk in and out, people drive around, they are used to it, it is like that is what our city looks like, that is what it has been like from the time that I was growing up, this is my city, you know. And then suddenly somebody comes from outside and says, what is going on in the city, why are they burning this over here, why are they doing this over here, why do not they put water here, <laughs> and it is like, oh, okay, oh, okay, I can do that, oh, okay, I can do that, okay. So, it is like, it's like a crazy uh, thing that, you know, um, you do not um, get to see some of the things that one has been doing oneself. So, uh, you might have to relook at your city and the sources of air pollution and new light, okay. Um, what else? Anything else about that? No, I think that is it. That is all about sources. But for students, I actually have them uh, list down the sources, okay. Um, sometimes they just think it is the industry out there, uh, but actually it is not. Um, and just so that I can complete this matter here, or maybe I will come to it a little later. All right. So, uh, okay, you already gone through this. Now, it is not, once you know what the point sources are, line sources are, you need to know where they are, okay. So, the location is important. So, you get a map, okay. This is a pretty crude map. You can do some really fancy Google map, Google earth kind of maps, okay. And, but the important thing is for one to be able to identify where the main sources of air pollution are, where is the main industry, where are the coal mines, what are the key traffic junctions, what are the key expressways over there, the highways over there. Uh, and relative to all of this, where are the six NAMP stations, the monitoring stations? You have these monitoring, six, man, nom, uh, six monitoring stations, six NAMP stations. So, you know, need to know where they are located, uh, so that you can begin to get a sense of how much of an influence uh, of a particular industry would be observed by, would be experienced by one of the, uh, one of the monitoring stations, okay. So, just some very basic intuitive information based on the data that you have for the last 10 years, the location, and how close it is to the industry, that itself can begin to reveal a picture, a larger picture, okay. Uh, the arrow over there I think indicates the prominent wind direction, prominent wind direction. So, uh, if you, if all the industry is here uh, and all the population is over, also over here and if most of the wind takes away the pollutants, then people in Chandrapur may not necessarily be affected. So, this is an interesting story, okay. See, um, Central Pollution Control Board has come up with an index called CEPI. It is the Comprehensive Environmental Pollution Index. It takes into account air, water as well as solid, soil. It turns out that Chandrapur was the fourth most polluted city in India, fourth, okay, number four. So, there are three other places more polluted than Chandrapur, but Chandrapur had this honor of being the fourth most polluted. And uh, Maharashtra Pollution Control Board was serious about this whole issue. So, they actually started to address this with the industry and said, listen, you really need to pull up your socks, you know, and get your act together and deal with this because this is not acceptable. So, apparently the industry did invest almost 400, 500 crores of money to upgrade the systems and uh, develop better pollution control systems. And that went on for about two years later when they re did, when they did the ranking again, uh, Chandrapur after spending about 400, 500 crores had moved from fourth most polluted to now second most polluted. From being fourth most polluted after spending 400 crores, they now at second most polluted. So, that is when it was like, okay, we really do not know what is going on over here. And uh, that is when Neeri, uh, Mumbai and IIT Bombay, we were invited to start looking at this whole issue. And it turned out that while the industry is polluting, uh, the influence that the industrial air emissions have on the city is very little. What is affecting the city was mainly two things. One was the coal cook stoves. So, whether it is summer time, whether it is winter time, whether it is monsoon time, people cook. Even during monsoon, people cook, right? So, does not matter which month of the year, there would always be in the morning a thick layer of smoke on all of Chandrapur, and in the evening again, a thick layer of smoke all over Chandrapur. 
okay and this smoke is not being emitted at 300 meter level 200 meter level 100 meter level height it is being emitted at where you and I are standing. So, the maximum exposure that anybody would have to this particular chula is to you and me okay. So, that is what and that is where the um, uh, monitoring stations are that is where the uh, samplers are you know. So, they are looking at so irrespective of which month the amount of pollutant at our level at the breathing level is the same. So, uh, that is one source of pollution the other source of pollution turned out is actually dust the roads ha are full of dust the cement industry while they might be emitting something at a height of the chimney say 100 meters or so I do not know the exact height of the chimney, but say 100 meters or so they are emitting at that level after control system. So, they are not really emitting very much whatever they are emitting is in compliance let us assume it is in a compliance okay they are emitting a certain amount over there that is now that a height is probably going to go a few kilometers and that is by that time it is gotten diluted by vertical mixing and dispersion etcetera etcetera by the time it gets there it is fairly diluted okay. Now, right from the factory as you step out the roads for every kilometer at least one kilometer on all sides whichever way the road goes to it is got this thick layer of dust which is almost 90 percent pure cement. So, any time a truck passes by or any time there is a, some cement falls off and over a period of time that entire area has gotten covered with the thick layer of cement which any time a truck passes by or a car passes by the wheels just resuspend all the dust ok. So, when you have sampling devices they do not know where this dust is coming from they do not know whether it is coming from the chimney or whether it is coming from the road and because road is in close proximity basically it is going to collect most of it and say hey this place is polluted and then everybody will say ok ok you know the chimneys are no it is not the chimney it is the road over there. So, to be able to therefore say what is the source of the pollutant and then be able to do. So, if we know if we know now maybe I am going a little ahead of myself as providing solutions, but since it is here let us talk about it. If it is coal cook stoves ok what is the way out? are you would you be able to develop a better coal cook stove. In fact, one of my PhD students is working on that right now to look to see whether we can develop a cook stove that is not combustion based which is gasifier based ok. So, we are studying to see whether we can scale a gasifier to that level apparently there are some designs available, but you know we it is sometimes proprietary and sometimes not enough scientific work has been done on it that we can go ahead and directly apply the design part is missing. In case we wanted to get you know improve cook stoves yeah you could do that, but then this is other thought ok. The other thought was can we give free electricity to everybody now that is a little out of box thinking it is a little out of box thinking, but can we give free electricity to everybody. Now, let us just do a back of the envelope calculation and it turns out that I think the power plant in uh, Chandrapur is of the order of about 2300. 40 megawatt somewhere there I, I think my memory might be failing me, but somewhere there 2300 plus and they are getting a new plant which is going to get commissioned which will add I think probably a th another 1000 megawatts, but let us just talk about the old one. So, the 2300 megawatt the amount of coal that is used on a daily basis if you did a calculation and you found out what percentage of that coal is actually being used for cooking purposes you know what is the cooking in cook stoves contributing to the it turns out that less than 0.1 percent of the coal that is being used in the power plant less than 0.1 percent is being used by for cook stoves. So, the thought then is it is just point I mean if you look at the way they meter the way they you know monitor how much uh, power is being produced in the power plant 0.1 probably is not even there in the resolution of the metering ok. They probably are looking at 1 percent or something like that. So, it is less than the resolution level of the coal that much coal just gets thrown and nobody even cares about it is that level. So, can we give free electricity to everybody? So, that was you know something we left we could not quite deal with it because it now becomes a policy issue um, and we are we do have uh, an MTech student who is working on that a little bit looking looking at different models uh, by which you can substitute. Of course, the first question that comes up with people will start see stealing electricity people will start hmm, they will be misusing etcetera etcetera, but you know what if you really did a cost estimate of how much would it take for you to control the pollution in air pollution in the city, how much would it take for you to take care of people who get get bad health 
because of air pollution. If you put all that cost together, you know, it might be cheaper to just give free electricity, even with the uh, stealing and even with the theft, whatever, okay? Uh, somebody interested in it probably should take it up as a project for study. Uh, uh, I'll just leave it at that, okay? All right, so this is basically saying where are all the locations of the sources, etc. And then, of course, you develop an inventory. Say how much sulfur dioxide, how much NOx, how much CO, how much PM. And then we discussed this that using emission factors, you can get an inventory at a 500 meter by 500 meter level, which is half a kilometer by half a kilometer. Okay, that's uh, pretty good. You would get some kind of inventory. So you know what is the source of pollution. So if SOX is not a problem, and NOx is not a problem, and CO is not a problem, don't go to those sources. They're okay. You don't have to do anything with them. Okay, but where does the PM come from? And if the PM is coming from a source which is not the same source as over here, then hey, that's what you need to focus on. Okay, all right. All right, of course, the third input that comes in then is the meteorology. You know your sources well, you know your line sources well, you know your point sources well, you know your area sources well, you also know the point sources, the height, area sources, you know the length and width, line sources, you know the length, you know all those things, those information is available through field surveys and sensors and RTO and all those data. Then you come to meteorology, right? And in the meteorology then you'd have to look at, you have to acquire it, okay? Some places have their own um, meteorological stations, most industry do. And uh, one of the things I'm going to point to is that just having an instrument is not enough. Um, having an understanding how to use that instrument is very critical. And it's very critical, I'll point to it in this Chandrapur case, that there's this one MET station which is giving wind speed, wind direction. And that data is being used for modeling all the work in Chandrapur. We just found out that the data, the, the way that MET station is placed, is placed against a wall in such a way that it does not really represent the wind conditions of that area, okay? So all the work that would have gone into modeling is suddenly not applicable because garbage in, garbage out, if you put in the wrong information on meteorology, you will get, you cannot get correct results, okay? Um, so one of the things that we are also working on right now, it's in the domain of our research, is what if we did not use weather stations for wind direction, wind speed data? What if we use satellite data? What if we used um, the, you know, the models, the global circulation models that they're using uh, for um, uh, weather prediction? Okay, they're pretty good now. I mean, they can actually predict weather up to the next four hours or six hours, okay? Um, so in that case, they should be able to tell us the wind speed and wind direction pretty accurately, right? Uh, but it's just that the weather, meteorology, it seems to be in a different domain. But no, it is absolutely applicable for air quality work. So we're trying to build at that interface and strengthen that interface uh, so that we become less dependent on ground measurements. Uh, ground measurements will always be there, will always be required. But how do you take a 10 meter measurement, which is done at all airports, for example. In, in, in Mumbai, for example, we use uh, the Santa Cruz airport data. So a measurement that was made at 10 meters height, how do you extrapolate it in terms of wind speed or wind direction to something which is 10 kilometers away and the emissions are at, you know, 250 meter height? I mean, how do you extrapolate that? You know, I, is your extrapolation really valid? Okay. Uh, maybe till 25, 30 years ago, we could not have answered this question. But given the satellites, given the advancements that we have in computational ability, given the uh, access we have to global circulation models, et cetera, et cetera, I think the time, you know, has come for us to do some leapfrogging and we don't have to go through the hardship and, of, and, and the uncertainty of all these other steps. So, you know, that's something that we are looking at. Uh, so, but for now, you know, we can acquire the uh, meteorological data. We want to make sure that the quality of the, air, uh, quality of the uh, meteorological data is also valid and that it makes sense. So we, if you look at, uh, you know, this is Chandrapur, this box over here is Chandrapur. It's a 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer area. Uh, the star is where the only, is the uh, meteorological station from which data are used, okay? It's at the power plant. However, the uh, Indian Meteorological Department uh, IMD stations are in the neighboring 
areas there are 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and where is the ninth one? Oh, right, it is hidden over here, ninth one. Okay? So, there are 9 of them in the vicinity, but nothing at Chandrapur. Okay? And the closest one is maybe about uh, you know Gachiroli, uh, Yavatmal and Nagpur. Okay? So, this is I think about 180, 170 kilometers. So, this would be about 100 kilometers, maybe this would be about 110 kilometers or so. Okay? So, that is those are the closest meteorological. Um, so, if I were to take data from here at a 10 meter height, data here at 10 meter height, data here at 10 meter height and then extrapolate it for what is going on in Chandrapur, I am not too comfortable. <laughs> okay, I am not too comfortable. I would much rather set up a MET station data here, but I have to be able to then compare it to see how does it compare with the neighboring stations. Okay? And this is not a very hilly area, you see a little bit of hilly area here little here hilly area, little here hilly area, but otherwise it is a pretty flat land. So, you know you can expect that the wind direction of wind speed may not change too greatly uh, in this flat land. All right. And so, what we when we say acquire the meteorological data, you actually have to register into the IMD, you have to pay a certain amount of money and uh, then they give you 6 months or something for which they can give you continue to give you data because you are a registered data user. Okay. So, these are the 3 stations that we got the data from Nagpur, Gachiroli and Yavatmal. And uh, so, I am just going to show you the wind roses. Everybody remember the wind roses? Wind rose is something that gives you uh, the uh, direction, uh, the speed and the frequency of the um, wind in a particular location. Okay? So, these are the wind roses uh, for these 4 locations. By the way, this is an annual wind rose which means it represents the average of the wind movement in terms of direction, in terms of speed and in terms of the frequency. Okay? So, these three if you notice these are all IMD stations all of them look pretty similar okay? whereas this one that we have at the power plant seems to have a mind of its own okay? so which actually had us doubt the quality of data coming from this place and the, mind you I have said a little earlier that these data this information was being used to model for all of Chandrapur area. So, if you putting in some wrong information then be assured that you know the results that you are going to get are not going to be correct. So, that is what our first indication was that something is off, something which is 100 kilometers away still seems to have a similar pattern, but something which is right in the middle of that triangle so to say for some reason is not matching up, so something has got to be off. So, we found that right next to that big red star which is the power plant, we actually have two smaller stars which were not such big plants, but one of them is a uh, um, cements plant which is an Ambuja cements plant and the other one is Lloyd metals. Okay. So, those are the 2 locations. So, we said okay, they have meteorological data as well and they have some wind roses that we can make from their data. So, let us just compare. Okay. So, that is what we did next. So, A is definitely the power plant, B and C are the other 2, uh, one is the Ambuja cement and the other one is Lloyd metal. Okay. So, uh, this is the one uh, which we are trying to check, this one did not match with Yavatmal, Gachiroli and Nagpur. Okay? So, we are trying to see whether the other 2 which are in the vicinity uh, do they match up. So, appear, no or they do not. Okay? So, these 2 clearly do not match up with this one at all. Now, if you look at these 2 then quite again they are similar and are not so different from the 3 IMD stations. So, clearly this one is off. Okay? Uh, however, just to be fair uh, these are from 3 different time periods for the whole year, but for different years. So, for us to be able to actually see whether this one matches or not, we have to take it for the same year. Okay? So, that is a part of the work that we are doing right now as we speak. So, for true comparison, MET data are required from A, B and C for the years for these years. Uh, so, that is uh, what we have been that is what we have been working on. So, uh, the next step usually also uh, when we are doing environmental impact analysis. Uh, one of the things that is done is that you take the proposal for a new industry and uh, you need to take permission okay, to install it. As a part of one of the steps in taking the acceptance or taking the approval is you actually have to establish uh, what kind of an impact this new industry would have on the region. So, at that point in time they actually go ahead and do the modeling work and we talked about this a little bit when we said the Gaussian plume model. Uh, there are some commercial software available, there is some open source software that is available. Uh, so, the you actually do the modeling to say okay, these are all the uh, key sources that I have already, 
these are all the line sources that I have already, these are all the uh, land or uh, area sources that I have already, this is the meteorology that I have for this location. Depending on different months, you'll have different meteorology. So if you want it at a daily resolution, then you'd probably need daily uh, meteorological data. But otherwise, if you did on a monthly basis or if you did on a night basis and a day basis, you can do all kinds of things with the model, okay? Those options are available. But you do this assessment to look to see what might be the worst case scenario. Typically, winter time in India is the worst case scenario because the air is cooler, mixing is not taking place, most of the contaminants tend to stay with the ground and therefore the pollution levels are highest. So uh, you need to be able to estimate uh, what is the influence. By the way, the other thing you can do in the model is uh, you can turn different sources off. You can turn them on, you can turn them off. So based on uh, you know, which one is on and which one is off, you can actually say how much pollution is being contributed to by a particular source. Okay? So those are some of the things that you can do. Uh, with the model. Now, I'm not going to get into model. It's not in the scope of teaching the student, teaching this to the students. But as a part of your accountability as someone who's uh, taking care of air quality management in your city, you'll know, you should know that modeling would be a very important component of the work that you do. Okay? Uh, it's otherwise extremely difficult to be able to, you just, even doing simple calculations can help. You know, you can make a rough back of the envelope calculation, etc. It can help. But really, it's very complicated and you really need to use a model. Again, just to be careful that when you're using a model, garbage in means garbage out. You've got to really choose and pick your data uh, that you're giving as an input for your model so that you can get reasonable results. Uh, if you are not sure about uh, the quality of the data, then you need to be able to spell that out and say, look, this is the level of confidence I have with the results over here. Okay? Uh, it's very difficult to go with any kind of conviction when it comes down to these models, especially if you know that your data, the quality of your data are a little iffy. Okay? So that's so much for model, you know, what, what you can do with the model. By the way, this, when we talked about it, this model is um, in a sense dispersion model. So you know the sources, you know the uh, wind speeds, wind direction and frequency, and then you say, okay, how much of it will affect which part of the area, etc., etc. Um, there are other models where uh, what you do is you actually go and collect the samples. Okay? You collect the samples. You can collect a sample for PM10. You can go and collect a sample for PM2.5. And then you do the chemistry on it. And based on the chemistry, if you do enough samples, uh, you'll, may, you'll be able to say, uh, look, this is likely to be coming 10% from vehicles and 20% from the power plant and the remaining 60% or so may be coming from dust. Okay? That's another way of going about it. That's working backwards. It's called source apportionment, and it's been used quite routinely, and um, it's very useful. Um, so that's another kind of modeling that is done. Again, way beyond the scope of uh, what is expected in this course, but in the background, I know students will ask these questions, and it's important to be able to then have some resource available that you can share with them. I've already talked about this. When you use a dispersion model to estimate the pollution isoplets, you can do daily, seasonal, or annual averages. You can paint different pictures. You can say business as usual. If everything was going the way it is already, what would happen? However, if you in made some intervention, so for example, if you removed all the dust from the road, if you eliminated the entire road and traffic from that particular section, then that's not getting added in the model as a source how much of an influence would it have on the overall air quality in the city. Okay? So you can pick and choose uh, the options that you ha might have for inter intervention. Okay? You may also be able to say which sources are affecting larger populations. So if you know that a particular region is going to get affected more, and that's the one which has highest amount of population, then don't put your stack over here. Don't place, don't locate your industry here. Find another location so that the population does not get exposed. Okay? That's the way you would do, deal with it. Okay, um, now you know. Let's get a little bit into the um, investigative mode. Okay, like a Sherlock Holmes, uh, like a detective. Okay, uh, we're talking about measurements which are routine measurements, but we are also interested in looking at some diagnostics. What, what is really the problem over here? What is actually happening over here? And uh, just some general questions may not be able to answer. Uh, so you need to specifically design 
a set of questions or a set of measurements so that you can do the diagnostics. Okay? So let me just share some of the things we've been doing. So I think I've already mentioned this to you that some of the work that we're doing at Chandrapur uh, is in collaboration with Niri. So Dr. Rakesh Kumar and myself and Professor um, uh, Rashmi Patel and we have three other colleagues uh, from uh, Washington University. Uh, Professor Jay Turner, Professor Rudy Huzar, and Professor Prateem Biswas. Professor Prateem Biswas is my PhD advisor. So, you know, they're also on the experts team. They're also advising us on some of the issues and how we need to deal with it. So there's a lot of learning that is happening across uh, the uh, uh, international boundaries. Okay. In fact, uh, some of the work, some other time I'll talk to you about data fed. Maybe another time we'll give you a seminar on data fed and how you can use that. It's a great tool. You can use it to be able to look at air quality issues in different parts of the world. Okay? We'll talk about that some other time. So let's see this, all right? This is now we're getting to diagnostics. So I'm saying, okay, this is the total amount of pollution that I measured it's over here. Let's say this is 350 micrograms per meter cube of particulate matter, PM10. 350 micrograms per meter cube, which is way above the compliance requirement of 100. Okay, so we say, based on my model, Based on my model, I put in all the key industrial sources, and my model is saying that this yellow part is coming from the industry. But you know, a lot of times we doubt whether industry is really reporting the correct numbers. Okay, there's a little bit of uh, suspicion always there. Okay, um, so okay, let's say whatever. Okay, let's say they are underreporting. Let's say they are underreporting. So they are underreporting by 50%. Okay? So then what I did this orange part, okay? Orange part is like let's say if the sources of the industry were doubled, if they were doubled, then we accounted for now about 40% of the overall. Vehicles, okay, they account for let's say another 20% or so. Oh, there could be some errors in measurements also. So maybe 5% for that. But you still have a good 25-30% and including this 10%, about 45%. So you still have about 40 to 50 percent that is not accounted for. So where is it coming from? So then you go back again to the model and you look to see uh, whether you really included everything. And it turns out that most of the time when we're doing modeling and we're looking at line sources, we're looking at the engine exhaust. We're looking at the exhaust which is coming out of the tailpipe. And you know how much is coming out from the tailpipe for every kilometer traveled for a diesel truck. So you can multiply the number of kilometers multiplied by the number of trucks, okay, and you'll get the total amount of smoke that has come out from diesel engine emissions. That's what we take for a line source. What we don't take for a line source is all the dust that gets resuspended every time a truck passes by on that cement, on that road which is near the cement factory. So hey, we never accounted for that. So therefore, you will continue to say that industry is the main polluter. That's not the case here. A good 40% may be coming from cookstoves. Nobody's taken into account cookstoves. Even today, we don't have an emission factor for a cookstove. The only emission factor we have for a cookstove, and there's a lot of studies that have been done on cookstoves. I'm sure you must have talked about and heard about and thought about improved cookstoves, better chulas, more and better improved chulas, better, better, super deluxe improved chulas. You must have come across all of those, okay? If you go to, you know, web, Google and you just say uh, cooks, improved cookstoves and I don't know how many thousands of, you know, hits you'll get. But show me one place where they have actually taken or, or quantified the amount of black smoke that comes out from a coal chula which is being burnt, doesn't matter in Chandrapur, anywhere in the world, show it to me. They'll only give you the emission factor when it is actually the combustion has started and you have taken it indoor to do the cooking. Okay? So those 15 minutes of this black smoke that is being spewed out, no accounting for that has been done. No, nowhere is it included in the inventory. Okay? So now suddenly now that needs to be taken into account. And you need to be able to say, look, a good 30% is coming from there. So if I were to do some any kind of accounting, if I want to consider some other options, can I give free electricity? Because this 30%, people will not stop to cook. They need to eat. Okay? You, you have to give them either something more convenient or it will actually be people's health and you know, Chandrapur, all of Chandrapur. When I was a kid, right, that time diesel locomotives were just getting introduced. So I still remember we used to have these coal steam engines which used to use coal. And uh, so anytime you went to the railway station, uh, you could smell 
coal burning okay you could actually add so mentally somewhere you know smell has a very interesting way of being stuck in your head um, for me the smell that smell was associated with railway station and uh, the moment i reached chandrapur all of chandrapur no matter where you are in chandrapur it smells like that railway station of my childhood and i stayed there for a few days and uh, you know every day i would experience a mild headache and i just thought maybe it is the stress or too much of traveling or whatever whatever and then but you know stress being in it campus is not less stressful you know you're working all the time in fact sometimes you're more than what you would be doing in the field so it's it was not stress actually i realized that the carbon monoxide levels in chandrapur are quite high okay and people are breathing it day in and day out and they don't even know that they are breathing high levels of carbon monoxide so a headache is something that is something to they don't even know that they have a headache <laughs> okay that's 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 how bad it gets okay so um it's important therefore to kind of look at the whole thing with new eyes uh, and look to see where is it that you really so the you know 300 400 crores that was spent give me that money now i'll probably be able to do even even if you put it somewhere as a you know as an endowment the interest that would get generated on it would be able to serve the cooking needs by electricity for that entire population of chandrapur for for decades to come okay come on you know you really need to think out of the box and deal with it it's just somebody's got to bring the will uh, i just saw the last slide which i think professor chandel had used right he said something about if you ask the scientist how much more carbon dioxide needs to be added or can be added they'll say none that answer is very clear okay so then the question is is now left to the economists it's not left to the economies okay that's what you have to deal with so locally what needs to be done somebody needs to bring bring this forth again we were discussing this for chandrapur we were discussing it with the member secretary of maharashtra pollution control board and he gave a very nice example he said somewhere in chatisgarh one collector has actually taken it on and worked with the uh, corporate uh, people they have a lot of funds available for corporate social responsibility and he's collected i don't know some 300 400 crores of money funds and he's just transforming that entire city okay so uh, i'm just letting you know that when something like that begins to happen in your city and the environment needs to be taken care of your voice should be the first one to be heard okay i'm inviting you i'm requesting you that you should be the first one to get up and don't be worried about how much you know even i don't know or everything in the world i really don't know but i know enough people who know and so i can always reach out to them and ask them for help so i'm inviting you to stand in a place that where you will be the resource person in your hometown in your home city when it comes down to environment and you should start asking some of these questions other people will not ask these questions so you i can hold to account you i can hold responsible you i can invite and request and cajole and you know i have an agenda with you okay you know that by now okay all right good let me move on to the next slide now you know chandrapur one of the diagnostic studies that we dealt with was in monsoon time it was a good time to isolate the combustion source from the dust emissions all the dust in chandrapur by virtue of the rains had deposited out right when it was wet so any time a truck would pass by or a car would pass by even in those cement filled uh, roads there was no dust being entrained where is the smoke from the chula and the smoke from the diesel vehicles continue okay and one of the things this is and this is where the beauty of that entire size distribution comes in i'm so sorry i couldn't bring that slide with me today i'll send it to you we actually went and did some size distribution measurements in chandrapur on a particular day normal summer day and we got two peaks we got one peak for pm 2.5 and we got another peak for pm 10 as expected that the following day it rained okay the day it rained we did the sampling again and the second peak which is the course mode the larger one just disappeared we were only left with the peak which is coming from combustion sources okay so it was very clear very black and white that the issue of pollution of particulate matter in chandrapur to a large extent is from two sources again from coal, coal cook stoves and from the uh, dust so if the dust got eliminated only the uh, pollution coming from the uh smoke and uh, from the chulas and from the diesel uh, trucks and vehicles was kind of left okay now both are pm10 by the way both are pm10 this one is pm2.5 it's a smaller fraction of this larger pm10 okay uh, however this is coming from the re resuspended dust this one is coming from smoke and we could actually distinguish that 
a little bit more work is required so that we can really nail it down. We're now doing the chemistry on these two. Okay? The chemistry of this will, by and large, if we are right, it will show up to be SiO2 mainly, or cement, because you know dust is getting, <laughs> the dust, that's what is on the road, right? It's going to be cement. Uh, and this one is likely to be more carbonaceous in nature. And we are looking to see whether we can do some further analysis to look at elemental carbon, organic carbon, some of the other details. Okay? All right. So we've talked about this. Domestic coal burning is an issue. Can we get a better coal chula? Uh, by the way, domestic use of coal is illegal, but you can't stop people from cooking. If coal is available and they have to cook, they will use it. Sometimes people said only the poor people are using coal because they can't afford LPG. That's not true. Even people who have LPGs in their, um, in their kitchens, uh, coal is available, I told you, right? It's freely available. So they don't use LPG for heating of water. Um, so they have an outside uh, cook stove which is using coal to heat up the water that is used for washing during winters, which is used up for washing or which is used. So it's got nothing to do with, it's just coal is freely available, so people are using it. Okay? Free electricity, I already mentioned, 36,000 tons of coal per day. 36,000 tons of coal per day being used in the power plant. Okay? So a very small fraction of that is being used for cooking. So if you can do that free electricity thing, somebody take it up with me and then we'll deal with it. We met with the collector. I keep talking about the collector. We actually went and met with the collector and we said, you know, we want to, on a normal day, we want to shut down all traffic. Let's say we do uh, some sampling on one Sunday and on the following Sunday in the same season, we actually have a no traffic day. So from six in the morning to about lunchtime, no traffic. All roads are bare, nothing, no, nobody, nobody's doing anything. And we do sampling to see how much of a contribution would traffic have to the pollution, okay? Uh, better ro road cleaning, these are some of the other things. By the way, there's a lot of coal depots also in Chandrapur. And uh, the collector you know, told us that uh, they had actually issued notices under section 133, 141, and 188. I don't know what these mean, but okay, some people in law actually understand what these mean. But apparently, these are for uh, public nuisance. So if your coal handling is causing public nuisance, then you're supposed to shut it down. And I don't know which one it is, but one is for public nuisance, and the other one is for repeated public nuisance. Okay, not just public nuisance, but repeated public nuisance. And I think one of those actually has you put behind bars. So, um, okay, that's the nature of the work in terms of banning the... Let's take a look at, you know, I was talking about this no traffic day. It's actually, you create an episode. It's an episodic event. Diwali is an episodic event. Rains are an episodic event. Uh, but, you know, in doing this uh, episodic event, I want to introduce you to the world of satellite data. Okay? Um, it's an exciting area of work now. Um, it's one instrument in that satellite, which is the same instrument is measuring all over the globe. Okay, so these are satellites which are in a polar orbit. Okay, they're going round and round from one pole to the other in circles, and they keep shifting. Uh, and so once in a day, they would pass over India. And at that point in time, they will capture the uh, quality of air uh, in that entire column between the sensor in the satellite and the ground, okay, the, the surface of the earth. The entire air mass is then evaluated for quality. Okay. Again, very detailed, I'm not going to get into it, but I do want to share with you because this is an area which some people may get excited about either doing their masters or their PhD, and sometimes students are always looking for some exciting new. So the moment you say NASA, or the moment you say ISRO, you know, it kind of lights up people's eyes to say, hey, that could be interesting work. Okay, so this, I just want to introduce this to you. Uh, we have been working with uh, the NARL labs in Gadanki, uh, which is near Tirupati. Uh, Dr. Uh, Harish Gadvi is our partner over there. And uh, we recently have launched, India, ISRO has launched a geostationary um, satellite, which actually is positioned, it's not orbiting. Uh, over the poles. It is actually stationary and it is uh, geosynchronous. So it rotates at the same speed as Earth. So it's always looking at India. Okay? So with that, instead of once a day, we get, you can get collect data at the rate of once in 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes you can get a snapshot of what's going in all parts of India and whether there is any movement of smoke or very, any movement of uh, pollutant mass from one part of the country to another part of the country. Okay? So those are some of the exciting uh, developments that are happening. Uh, let me just show you this episodic event. In terms of the episodic event, 
um, we, um, there's this, I told you there's this huge power plant and uh, in the summer of 2010, okay, in the summer of 2010, uh, there was a power plant shutdown because water was scarce and they need water. Okay. Water was scarce, so they actually had to take a shutdown for three months. Not a small time for a power plant okay, of that size. Three months there was a shutdown. So what we did was we said, oh, okay, if that's what happened. Uh, that's good news for us because it's an episode. It's a rare episode, but it's an episode. So we said, okay, let's take a look at the satellite data for the, those three months. But not just for 2010, we want to compare it with the same months in 20, 2009 and the year 2011. Okay? So that will tell us whether the particular uh, source, which is the main source in Chandrapur, uh, how is it affecting the air quality. Okay? So we went for a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer resolution and uh, we looked at the aerosol optical depth, which means you are looking at particulate matter. These are the satellite images colorful. Look at those lovely colors. Now let's just actually go the next step and look at what those colors mean. So I just want to tell you that this black frame is the 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer area of Chandrapur. Okay? So each of those uh, boxes have that 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer square. There is this little box over here also. It is the Vani area which is also under study for different reasons. So. Uh, these are the three months, April, May and June. These are three years, 2009, 2010, 2011. This is the year, this is the year where the plant was shut down. So if I were to compare April for the year before and April for the year after, clearly the pollution levels are very high compared to the shutdown year. Similarly for May, similarly for June. So it is very clearly saying that that particular power plant has a huge influence in that region. Okay? So you wanted a power plant shut down, we shut down the power plant. Not knowingly, not deliberately, but you know, some operational requirements, it shut down. This is you get to see, you get to see this. Same instrument, same instrument a year ago, same instrument a year later. So there is no issue of quality of the data. Quality is assured because it is the same instrument. Okay? This here, it is a little difficult to interpret. More red means more pollution. I think just that let us just leave it at that. Okay? All right. The next thing we did was this is for particulate matter, but then we also looked at the NO2 density, okay? the concentration of NO2. Now the good thing about NO2 is that it is short lived as a molecule. It does not live as NO2 for very long. It reacts with other uh, components, other molecules in the atmosphere in the lifetime of NO2 is very small. So if you see it there, that means it must have come from there because it can't travel. By the time it travels, it would have disappeared. So if you see it there at that moment, that means it is from coming from there. That may not be the case for particulate matter. Depending on the wind, depending on the height, you could actually have particles coming from across another continent and coming at a height of let's say 3 kilometers up there. Okay? That is going to get counted in that column which is not the case for NO2 because NO2 is right there, right then you are measuring. So the source of pollution is right there. So that is a good thing about NO2. Once again, if you look, this particular year, the NO2 levels were much lesser compared to the year before and compared to the year later for the same months. Okay, this is excellent. This is great. This is actually good diagnostics. However, it is still at a, you know, for the previous slide that I showed you, for this one, it is at a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer resolution. And for this one, it is at a 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer resolution. Okay? That is like not so good resolution. So the effort right now is that we are looking at going for uh, 1 kilometer by 1 kilometer uh, or 5 kilometer by 5 kilometer. 5 kilometer by 5 kilometer is already available actually. Uh, 3 kilometer by 3 kilometer also might be available. One of the PhD students is working on that. Uh, one of the other PhD students right now is working on, these are all from the polar, pol polar satellites. Uh, one of the students right now is working on uh, a geostationary to look to see how we could possibly take the uh, information that is available from ISRO uh, for air quality work. Okay? So this is great, okay? satellite work. I am not going to talk too much about the action items because I think we have already discussed some of those action items. If the road 
dust is what is contributing, then take care of the road dust. If uh, it is, you know, coal uh, cook stoves that are the problem, then take care of the cook stoves. If it is the chimneys emitting at a high level, then take care of that as a problem. So actions are pretty obvious once the diagnostics are handled, okay. Uh, but you know, if you find out as a collector of your city, as the person accountable for your city, that listen, you know, whether it's Knox, whether it is Sox, whether it is particulate matter, my city is clean, I am fine, I am done, okay. Which is great, congratulations, that's, you know, fabulous. But you should just know that sooner or later, uh, as the development is happening, and as the years are going by, as the population is increasing, uh, your city might actually reach a point where now it will be out of compliance. So therefore, it is important to look at future projections in a time frame of 5 years, maybe 10 years, maybe 50 years. When I say 50 years, I just sent a paper this morning by Professor Sukhatne, where actually what he's done is, he's, he's not focusing on air quality, he's dealing with energy needs in India, okay. And he's saying over the next 55 years or so, which is the year that he has is 2070, says the population of the world, population of India also would have stabilized by the time we get to the year 2070, which is about 55 years from now. So, we're talking about sustainability, right? What do we need to do today? What do we need to understand today such that by 2070, when the population would have stabilized, that we have our systems and our understanding and our structures in place such that we can actually uh, begin to uh, bring that kind of a reality in. Um, 55 years. I'm going to be here for much of the 25 years, for 55 years. I promise you I'll be around, okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, let's at least promise for the next 20 odd years we'll be playing together and then we shall see. We'll probably uh, then by that time have passed it on to other people, all right. So, future projections again, the satellite data are very good in being able to look at synoptic view in terms of time. So here, for example, I'm showing you some images of Maharashtra for the year 2005 to the year 2010. So this was happening in 2005, 2006. This is happening now. Clearly, there's been an increase in the NO2 levels. Okay, this is the Chandrapur area, by the way. Different times of the year. This is winter. This is uh, pre-monsoon. This is post-monsoon. Okay, so clearly, you know, we got some issues over here. So Chandrapur is definitely this area. This is Chandrapur area. Clearly, but a little south of Chandrapur, a little south of Chandrapur, somewhere in Andhra, I think, there is another power plant and we need to identify it because notice, okay, there's a large amount of that particular redness over here which is increased, not particularly in the Chandrapur area, but it is a little more on the south of that, okay. So something's going on and therefore it is something without a boundary. So you can't say Maharashtra boundary and, and uh, you know, Andhra boundary. You just can't do that. You know, you can't even do that for countries anymore. What's happening in India and, in, you know, north of India is going to affect Pakistan or what's happening in Bangladesh is going to affect India. You know, so there's no boundaries around there with air. So therefore, you have to always be able to look at a synoptic view and see, you know, where things are happening and how. And, you know, air is something which is all over the, all over the globe. This is some regulation structures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. The only thing I want to leave you with over here is we've talked about these things, emission factors, compliance requirement, best available control technology, economic incentives, okay, some students might get interested in this, et cetera. They have these trading permits and this, we're still trying to get our act together. It's done quite successfully in the U.S. and now it's coming in because of the uh, carbon dioxide, the footprint, the, you know, carbon credits, et cetera, et cetera. They want to monitor how much emission is being coming so that you can get accordingly. If you, if you, if you uh, curtail a certain amount of uh, uh, emissions, then you get, you know, some credit for it, et cetera. So trading permits is, the way I do it in the class is I say, okay, this person, he's uh, a good person. He set up his industry last year and he's used it, the best available control technology, and he's emitting uh, only 50% of what he's allowed to permit. So actually he has 50% credit. Here's another person, he's a bad person. Not really because he was born bad, but because he inherited uh, his uh, industry from his grandfather who set it up in 1958, okay. And that was set up in 1958 and today they are, you know, if they were to replace the available, uh, replace their systems with the best available control technologies, they're so expensive that they go out of business. So this person is polluting more than he should, and this person is polluting less than he should. So can I get these two people together 
and do some because this person's investment in better available control technology may be able to offset uh, this person's uh, inability to pay for it. So there's, you know, there's some kind of a win-win situations that are brought. There are people who have controver controversial a lot of times, but still people are trying out these different models to be able to bring win-win situations. That's the end. I think I have some a little, little more. Okay, it can't be end so quickly. One second. Okay, uh, all right. So having passed on the torch to you, so to say, my job here is done. I'm not saying I'm going away anywhere. I'm around. Okay, I'm around, and I uh, promise that I'll be around for as long as uh, I can be of service to you. Uh, for sure, for the next uh, few days, and then two weeks after the uh, training program is over. And uh, after that, you know, I'll leave it open to you to kind of reach out and uh, bring that partnership because at some point in time. Uh, I'll have to keep, you know, I'll have to, I can't keep saying you've got to be on the mission. You'll have to choose to, choose to be on the mission or not, okay? So I'll leave it to you. It's an invitation, and you're anytime invited to come and join the mission, okay? And uh, I have a few more slides which are available, which I thought you might be able to use somewhere in your teaching. So I'll just share them with you. Uh, but you should, you should just know that uh, my job is done. OK, this is just some icing on the cake. And let's have some fun Okay, for the next few slides. All right, so here we go. Uh, you might need this when somebody's talking about global warming. This is the solar spectrum. This is the Earth spectrum. This is the different wavelengths at which different gases absorb different wavelengths. So this over here is transparent to most of the greenhouse gases. This is not transparent to the uh, greenhouse gases. Therefore energy get, tends to get trapped on the, in the Earth's atmosphere, okay? Uh, you can use that. By the way, I always give the URL, so you're more, more than welcome to go. A lot of this stuff is on Wikipedia, okay? You should just, you know, a lot of times, like Professor Fartak was saying, we're doing this flipped classroom kind of a situation. Let students, give them an assignment, uh, go, let them do the homework before they come for the class. So when they come for the class, then they can just ask questions. This is a simple uh, back of the envelope calculation to understand uh, what is the influence of global warming on the planet? If there was no greenhouse gases, if there was no greenhouse gases at all, then the temperature of Earth would have been minus 18 degrees Celsius. This is a very straightforward uh, calculation that you can do. It's taken from masters. I can give you the reference for that. Okay? Very simple. All you're doing is you're looking at the total amount of energy coming from the sun, 1 minus alpha, where alpha is the albedo, which is the amount which gets reflected back. So about 31% of the radiation that comes from the sun gets reflected back, doesn't participate, no change, just gets reflected back. So you're left with only a small fraction, which is about 0 0.7, 0 0.69, about 70%. That you multiply with the projected area of the Earth, which is pi r squared. Okay? That's at one temperature at which the Earth is receiving the radiation. And then if you treat Earth as a black body, as a sphere, which is radiating at a certain temperature because it is at a certain temperature, what temperature that is, we don't know. That's what needs to be calculated. Okay? But this time, the area is 4 pi r square because it's the entire surface area, not just the projected area. It's radiating from all over the spherical area. When you equate these two, it turns out that the temperature of equilibrium of the Earth, if there was a radiation balance, turns out to be minus 18 degrees Celsius. Okay? Whereas the fact of the matter is that the average temperature is about 15 degrees Celsius on the planet. Average temperature on planet is 15 degrees Celsius, which makes it uh, livable. So that additional 33 degrees is coming from greenhouse gases. Okay? That's the amount of heat. It's like a blanket on the planet Earth, which is keeping, keeping it a little warm. Okay? That's, that's, the, uh, that's the delicate balance that we have with the greenhouse gases. And in terms of the uh, overall, it's uh, the amount of heat that is becoming available. Or retain, it's like if you would take every meter square of the area and put a 155 watt bulb on it as to provide the heat. That's the level of heat which is being provided by the greenhouse effect on the planet. Okay? Um, another good example that I use uh, is we talk about men are from Mars and women are from Venus or something like that, I believe. Right? Okay, so Mars and Venus we're going to compare because our two nearest uh, neighbors. So if you compare, you know, this is the amount of energy being received by Earth per square meter. This is the amount being received by Venus. This is the amount being received by Mars. Okay? And the temperature uh, on uh, Mars is kind of less. It's a little cold on Mars. So somebody once said that if there were certain kind of bacteria, some bacteria are known, if we introduce these bacteria onto Mars, 
it will generate enough greenhouse gases that it will warm up. In, and in 200 years, it will become livable for human beings. Pretty good, huh? So you could actually, within 200 years, we can actually have Mars become livable, in terms of the temperature at least. Now, going by the uh, same thing, but you know, I'm going to switch the entire, uh, you know, what do they call it? Corollary, right? Corollary. corollary. By corollary, however, some, some bacteria on the planet, okay, some bacteria on the planet are generating enough carbon dioxide on the planet that would make the planet unlivable for human beings on Earth. Okay, so with that kind of, a, I tend to dramatize that a little bit so that students can actually begin to appreciate that while we are talking about making Mars livable, Earth, the way we know it, may not be livable because of the activity that human beings have. Okay, all right. Not all greenhouse gases have equal potential for global warming. So carbon dioxide, if you were to take it as one unit, then methane, for example, is 21 times more potent or 56 times more potent, depending on which model you use and what is the fate of that molecule, okay? Molecule will remain in the atmosphere for certain number of, certain amount of time. So depending on what the model is giving as an input, uh, it will give you different results. But clearly, uh, different gases, depending on which model you're using, would have different global warming potential, okay? So those are some of the things that need to be talked about. Energy, this is the last thing, I think. You know, I have something else over there. But last thing that I want to share with you, human beings are 100 watt machines. So when I was born, my mother told me that I was actually born with a label, like you have equipment. You know, any equipment will tell you how many watts it is. So for example, an iron is about 1100 watts. Uh, a mixer could be about 1200 watts. Okay, uh, A bulb, a tube light could be 40 watts. A CFL lamp nowadays is much lesser. But when I was born, I was born with a label that said, 100 watts. So I am, ladies and gentlemen, a 100 watt machine. You should find out. You should find out from your mother what was the label on your arm when you were born. Okay. So a 100 watt bulb is one person, that means. Driving a car, I don't know how many people, that means. Making a milkshake, I know it's about 12 people. So every time you have a milkshake or you have lassi, if you're fond of lassi, and you take that mixer and you say <laughs> in the mixer, right? So for those 15, 20 seconds, you have 12 people, ladies and gentlemen, who are working for you to make good milkshake or good lassi for you. Okay? So it's important for you to be able to look at it from the energy perspective and the footprint that we have as human beings. Last thing, I just want to share with you some of the exercises that I do. So some of these things I've already shared with you. Uh, Bhopal Gas Leak is a tragedy. It's a movie that I show in my, I give as homework actually. Uh, there's another short film, I'll give you access to that, at least the link for that. There's the Yale report, which I'll give you information. These two papers I've already posted on Moodle. These two I will post on the Moodle. Then there's a video by Sri Jairam Ramesh, uh, which I have students see in the, as a part of the homework. And then I ask them some questions on the movie. Uh, one of them is, what are the key issues of environmental protection governance of, for India that Sri Jairam Ramesh highlighted in his interactive session at IIT Bombay? Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. and. Uh, I look forward to your partnership. We will continue to talk. I'll come every day to come and say hello to you. And uh, we will uh, be in touch. So thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Good night.